Um, good evening, guys. Ken at Tortoise Capital with a review of the weekend trading plan for it'll be September 26th. This is September 25th, 2020 right now. Uh, the nightly Friday, the Friday night strategy podcast. So uh, I, I want to just start in the usual way with the, you know, the daily debrief, and then we'll plow into the um, you know, the sector review and then the weekend reports. I just want to, I, I kind of like the way that that gets us into the, uh, into the assessment of the environment, the operational assessment, we would call that. Um, so. Get my brushes calibrated here. Okay, so um, uh, the first thing I want to do is kind of take a look at this whole 10 day frame. You know, that's this one. So it's about a 7% from, you know, top to bottom. So I think of that as the frame. I, I, visually, I like that little box. Someone just talk a little artistically right now. Visually, I like that box because that box feels like, you know, the uh, the NDX ten. So I can see that 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 score of a hundred right here, and I can see that score of uh, zero right there. Um, it's not technically the NDX ten. It's really just the ten day trading range because. The NDX 10 would actually incorporate this day and it would only look this far, right? And then we would we would score this price with this as the score of zero and that is the score. So it's not quite the NDX, but you kind of get the get the feel of it. Um, today's range. I like picturing that in yellow I, I just am feeling a little artistic tonight so my stylistic choices I like that yellow because it lets me zero right in on today's price action inside the larger 10-day context and then that is nested inside the 30-day context and that's where these are these little blue boxes are just helping me visually just identify that 30-day high so I can tell it at a glance, you know, where that thing was made. And it doesn't seem like much, but it actually helps a little bit. It feels like it, it's paddles that's locking it in. Um, so as I'm as I'm feeling what this is saying to me, I um, the first thing I I see is how that river is rolling over, and then I feel how that piece are has come down to here, you know, and that's just locking in, you know, the, it feels like a compression band or something, you know, um, that's keeping all the price down. And then this little extension from here down is just saying, if nothing changes with the, you know, there's some underlying system at work, you know, some three-dimensional box of magic that, you know, all these variables are going into it and, magic is a hap is happening and then outputs happen you know this is essentially that magical market box which i don't know what's inside that all i know is that stuff goes in and then stuff comes out and i'm trying to manage the information that comes out the results i'm just managing the results and i suppose you know i could infer and i do infer that there are some causal factors going on in here that's a seductive line of reasoning because if you believe that, then you say, well, I, I just have to go back here and take a look at the right combination of inputs, and then I can apply that process model, then I can infer the outcomes, and then I can get into forecasting and predicting. And there's no shortage of that, guys in search of the magic bullets and all that. And they can make persuasive arguments why that, that that can be done. 
and I suppose, and, and I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying that's not, uh, that's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm really just trying to say is given that there is some complex adaptive system over here, a CAS complex adapt adaptive, a complex adaptive system. That's an open-ended system. You know, it looks like, um, um, instead of a really tightly constrained system, you know, and all the information is in here that I can figure out and make sense out of it, you know. Um, if you say, no, this thing is a is an open system where there's important new variables coming in and moving out all the time, and the size and scope of this thing is getting bigger and smaller, usually bigger, that this thing is just like a tornado. And while you can understand the physical processes of the tornado, it just happens that that information is in such uh, a state of constant turbulence that genuine forecasting and predicting with precision is not really possible. So when you think about how they, you know, the storm trackers, they project, hey, here's where that darn storm is. And we think that it's going to take this kind of statistically determined pathway you know and then they track the course of the storm and it's more or less correct so there is a certain management of storms which feels very much like what i now realize i'm trying to do here with the these statistical measures and so as i'm feeling through here i i, I just feel like the uh you know that that bollinger band mean is that center line of the storm so far you know and you can get the general trend in the last 10 days, but the real dynamic happenings up here at the cutting edge can, you know, it's now that distance away from the storm center that now becomes really important. And so that's why that the zero line, the baseline, and then plus one, you know, Z1 and Z2 and Z3 up there, that now starts feeling like it's important. You know, that's the managerial effort. If the if the uh, long term view of it is this 30 period, now this RL10 is I'm treating that as the actual plot line of the real center of the storm. And now you have this variation in the price action, which gives you that within that day it was up and it was down. But generally speaking, to be consistent and simplified and true and real center of the price that's what that rl10 now kind of feels like you now you guys are here at the birth of a new metaphor or a new analogy because i've never really explained it that way before um i should have saved that that was cool So yeah, I I kind of I kind of like that. That was the uh, storm analogy. So this is that longer term pressures, and then the actual path is that RL ten. And you can see how that thing is navigating back and forth across that longer term center line. And then each of these little daily bars is sort of that dynamic uncertainty inside it. And then this yellow one now, you know, today's most current storm track gives you that degree of energy or nervousness in the service and puts that in perspective. So now we can take a look at the, you know, the one day the 10 day, and now in this case, the 30 day uh, range. And so now I can feel where it entered the box. That blue helps me see that 30 day high, the 10 day high, and then the combination here, the 10 day and 30 day low. Um, this PSAR plus one now, you know, now that I feel how this thing is rolling over, this is the more tightly constrained PSAR. 
And then this is the projection of that PSAR so that unless something changes in that underlying market system generator, which is mysterious, that's the black box with all those inputs, that output is what's producing, you know, this this change on the, if, if this was the head of the dragon, you know, that's how I feel about this, this big thick orange dragon in his body. And when he's bouncing off that 30 day low, it now feels like, you know, for so far, that's, uh, you know, that's a one day, one day bounce. Last time he bounced down here, it went that far. And it's gone that far again. And so it hasn't come through the dragon altogether yet. You know, so if I just take this and say, hey, here's the dragon projection. It hasn't come all the way through the dragon and emerged yet. And so this has to get through that upper wall, if you will, of the PSAR. Um, this RL30 has given us some kind of, you know, health of the trend is definitely down when that thing rolled, was up and then rolled over. Down she goes. And that dragon paralleled that. And that turns a little quicker than 30. So now you can see that that price has to really contend with you know, resistance all the way through here, that until it gets through that, all of this resistance right here, um, these nice little, these nice little bounces up are nice, but that can just as easily sell off. So knowing that that is the case and knowing that that's what happened here, and knowing it in a sense, that's what happened up here. This is really possible. And now I want you to notice how important it is in our view that this thing like the 30 day low and the lower bound of the RL10, those become really important checkpoints for these big moves down. So now this, 333, which is the southern skin of the RL10, that's an important price level. I'm sorry, that's 323. 323, my bad. There's, there's 330, 340, 350, 360, and we talked yesterday about the importance of those $10 segments. So now 320 is really the line in the sand because that's the 30 day low and the 10 day low and it's a round number. And if that fails, then obviously 310 is the next one in play, which used to be almost a Z3 excursion way over here. You know, um, here it was up at plus Z2. It would have taken, let's count them, uh, Z1, Z0, Z minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. So on this day, when it was up around 356, the RL10 peak, at a Z2 excursion up in here, we were we could look at that stack and say, God dang, um, that's, you know, one, two, three, four standard deviations away to be all the way back here at 320. Well, that's what it took to make that move. And now here we are down around 320. You know, we're, we're at 323, with the, which is three bucks above 320, which is 1%. And we're gonna see that's, that's uh, one half of an ATR or less. That's how much buffer there is inside here. There's only half an ATR, so it wouldn't take much to make that crash. And if that crashes, then 310 becomes in play. Because 
all of this price action then would be negated and you say, oh yeah, it's everything down. So far, so good. All right. So, uh, so now I'm looking at these little calibrated. I just added this. I, I kind of like that. This gives us almost like, uh, you know, guitar strings or that calibrated template of future price moves in standard increments. You know. So now, based on what we just said, I can now kind of look at this. Um, this dragon projection would look like this. And we just got into the edge of the dragon. And now, you know, we got to see it get above Z1, spine of the dragon, upper skin of the dragon, um, the PSAR. So now all of these are support level, or I'm sorry, resistance levels that it has to get through as it figures out where and it's going to open inside here. You know, we we want it to do that if we want to be long. So all of these now are price levels on the way up. It has to get through. And if it can get past this PSAR resistance, then we could say, okay, now this may actually be good. And it turns out that... Um, this may actually then have been a swing low. Now, I, I'm noticing that the RL10 got a little less steep, so this thing could actually start, you know, if this looked like that, we would see the, um, we could very easily see on Monday that that baby dragon reverses. And then that could be the cross. And then you would see a, supported spring crossing somewhere around here in the next, you know, one, two, or three days. So that's a supported spring crossing. And so what we're doing there is we're just stalking that and we're framing it and saying, yeah, that's that's a scenario. So we're in this current situation, you know, at time zero, and we're saying, well, the scenario for a supported spring crossing would look like this the for a sideways quiet channel would argue oh no it's just gonna it's just gonna grind so there's some scenario like that there's some scenario where there's uh an immediate like collapsing dragon and the next leg down and say well if it were a collapsing dragon how far could it go or would it go that's where we would go back to the last to the last move we say well what was that move like and we say, oh, well, it looks probably like this. The last time that it rolled over, it went from about here down to about there. What's that move? Well, that's 340 to 320. So that pulse is about a $20 move, uh, which is about a 6% move. So if this were to roll over then, the trigger would be this. And so that's where, you know, I would say certainly 310 as halfway and then 300. So if we said 20 bucks was the impulse, then halfway would be 310. So if this collapses at 320, then you're really, that first leg is like 10 bucks. So if this does fall over and you decide to get short inside here, what you're really trying to do is front run it so that when it cracks that line, you don't start chasing it. You've already built in a little bit of bonus, and then you're, you're hoping to capture about 10 bucks. 
but then you notice eight hey, that's already down here at z3 so if it only comes down to the z3 line which is 315 you just say to yourself am i willing to call five bucks mine i would yeah that's 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 1.5 percent so i'd be willing to capture that so now what i'm doing is i'm building expectations for performance of what could happen in three different possibilities that come out of the current situation. So we're looking at what happens if it goes up or it goes down or kind of mucks around sideways, because we know that the current situation always has, you know, those kinds of moves baked into the case. It could be a collapse. It could be a slow slide. It could be a sideways chop. It could be a quiet grind. It could be an explosive recovery. You know, this one seem, feels like the least, <laughs> the least probable, but the, my estimate of probability doesn't mean anything because I'm so wrong so often on that, that what I need to do is have these, these kinds of scenarios built five fingers of death, great martial art. So the current situation at time zero always has those kinds of um, possibilities from every, it's like a train station. It can always pick one of those five tracks. And then the actual path it takes, you know, um, just, oh it's, oh, it's like this. Oh no, now it's like that. Oh, now it's like that. And so there's a little wandering path but you end up taking that template, that little framework, um, and it's always kind of going around in this spiral as it goes forward. And then you're just tracking the, uh, you know, you're tracking the storm or you're tracking the path that the drunkard takes, the drunkard's walk. So that's a good book. You know, the drunkard's walk, which is that traditional name for the path of price because that that's what it kind of looks like is whoa and yet we're trying to say hey no there's really some deep order that we could we could uh, look into the mind of that drunk and so we should have been able to predict that it was going to do that okay well good luck with that i'm more interested in this as a as a management tool so um i kind of like that picture too I think it was uh, Burton Malkiel wrote that one, M-A-L-K-I-E-L, -E um, The Drunkard's Walk. Uh, pretty good book. Let's see here. You know, this almost feels like, you know, take four. Ken, try to say something useful for a change. Um, let me know if you find this, if this is useful to you. Now I'm going to bring the, uh, you know, the, the craftsman or the draftsman's mentality to this so I can be a little more precise in what I'm looking for. All right, so I would be looking to... Uh, um, Come on, brush. Yeah, I'm looking to uh, to add to that position. I kind of like this turning motion. And if it adds to it, that's a, it just would have gone from a Z3, a former Z3 across Z2, going up through Z1, and the next stop would be up in here. So I'm ready to buy instantly a breakout um, that crosses Z1 at 330 and I think then the next test would likely be this PSAR and then the Bollinger Band mean so 
um, I could I could see at starting a position here. Um, I think I would add a position at about 335 on a swing because it will have broken through the PSAR. With a third position at the Bollinger Band mean and a fourth position on a 10-day high. So each one of those would be places where I would consider. And what I would do is if I looked at this, like it, like if, it, uh, if I get an entry and it starts just moving up, Every time it hits one of those checkpoints, you know, I see it going up, you know, directly. Then I do a quick, uh, a quick systems check, a quick ecosystem check once around the perimeter. So that, is there any reason not to do that? And that should take me about one minute to make a rapid assessment. Say, if there's no reason not to do it, then what I plan to do, I'll just go ahead and do and make that, make that another entry. So that's what I would do, I think. Here, when it comes out of the dragon and crosses the PSAR, crosses the Bollinger Band mean, and then breaks out a 10-day high, by that time, I would have one, two, three, four positions built. And then this would be gains. And then that would be one, like, pasture or one, one area. And then the next step would be, could that maintain its momentum and test test here by that time if it broke out to an all-time new high i should have the gains from four positions plus whatever else i was able to add in here and then if it if it got above there you'd say oh yeah well the the election really loves whoever is our new president and uh and then this would be a way to scale back in in a very contentious market the downside on this is just so easy to to argue that really I, I look at the, uh, you know, your resistance lines now. Let me draw these in by us. The RL30 and the Z1, the upper skin of the dragon and the piece are. So if this price action here is rejected in here and starts to roll over, I want to get short, you know, not later than about here. Like 326. 326 gives me enough room to get short in this zone so that I have one position short. So that if it cracks 320, which is a 10 day low, 30 day low, long term fair value, that if that support level cracks, bang, uh, down I go. And so you'll notice that when this this RL10 right here, even though price is going up, that's really where, oops, that's the price level. So around 323 is the price level where I really, ha I feel like I have to get short in here. Between 323 and 320, this is the prime time to get short so that when it is confirmed, that the weakness really is weak and selling pressure is going. Um, I already have some money in the bank. And then my stop, which would be right about there. I can move that to no lose plus dinner for two and lock in those gains. And then it's a science project. Okay. So that's my, that's my view of the, um, uh, of, of the marketplace. And, you know, you get the same impression from the 30 day. All I really need to know from the 30 days was the high and the low. Uh, oh, there was the turning point and there was the 10. So now this is, this just gives me enough context for these larger, longer term moves. And you can see how everything is coming to a point down in here. Okay. So that's my. That's my general approach to framing the market conditions. All right, what happened in the sectors today? Okay, so it was generally up, so I'm going to cover the upside. So here's the S&P at plus 1.6. Uh, 
I'm, I'm sorry. One, yeah, one point six two. Um, the Russell, the Russell also at one point six two. Uh, the the Dow at one point three. Uh, treasuries basically flat. So there was no urge to get out of the treasuries. Just they stopped buying them. So that's not that is a piece of information that says that today was a one day bounce off the the new thirty day low. That's all that was. It didn't it touch the edge of the dragon? But no confirmation yet going into the weekend. So that's just biding their time. And uh, and even the speculators didn't really push it far beyond what the market was. This was just kind of the market idling, made a little bounce off a low, uh, made some tactical gains, and is waiting to see what next week brings. Okay. So let's see the sectors that work. So if the market is 1.62, you had tech and clean energy lead the way up. So tech at 2.4. Uh, clean energy at 4%, the triple techs, you know, better than 7%, and uh, not much to choose between them, the broad sector and the narrow sector. Um, now, the individual companies, the usual suspects, Twitter got what the market got, um, Facebook, Salesforce, Fangs, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, NVIDIA, Tesla. So, all the usual suspects that that when tech does really well like it did you know the the leading contenders pulled it north a few other non-tech things that uh, showed some strength uh cliff three percent um boeing 6.8 but other than that pretty uh, conspicuously devoid of anything anything else so this was a tech bounce today and that is all um, the things that were worse than the s p in the sectors so these are the red boxes what were the things that underperformed well uh, healthcare was about the same at 1.6 uh, plus 1.6 discretionary and commercial real estate plus 1.1 and 3 Finance and materials lagged the market, but were in the green, 1% and 0.8. Uh, basically flat was Mexico, Japan, emerging markets, energy, um, Brazil and wheat and precious down 0.6 and 0.8. Oil exploration and silver down 1.2. The underperformers today, uh, Devon Energy, Alcoa, which to me is troubling for, for them because uh, the market bounced and XLB and E were okay. But my little bellwethers, Alcoa, Devon, DuPont, Oil, Goldman, Walmart, Cat, U.S. Steel, all these things were underperforming their sectors. Um, so this was just very few things going up. So I guess if I were going to draw a picture of that, I would do, I would probably draw it this way. Let's see if I can quickly sketch that. You know, so on a day where, yeah, it's just, that looks like crap. Just too slow to respond. So what that feels like to me was that um, on a day where the market plus 1.6, but one ATR would have been ATR would have been 2.4% ish. This thing got two thirds <coughs> of an ATR. And the only things that really were up big was XLK, the techs, and all the other things that are components of the market were down. 
So you had XLE, XLF, XLB, um, XL. V was basically even with the market. So you had a much broader base pulling it down and only one little thing pulling it up. And even that was, you know, half the techs, you know, it was new techs pulling it up and older tech was, was basically flat. So the actual strength of the market today was just those. Apple, Google, Tesla, Microsoft, Facebook was in there. So all the old usual suspects. So that little plus 1.6 today going into the weekend, you know, so this whole week felt like a smash down, finished with one little micro up, but you got all the strength of the dragon pushing it down. You had the uh, the RL30 is pushing it down. The PSAR dots are all pushing it down. And that key price level at 320. So we're about 326. And at 323. Is right here. So if this thing does fail tomorrow, I want to get short right around in here in this pocket because this thing will have rolled over so that when it officially cracks right here, I can get a second position in and then my then my stop would be right about here if I'm short in here. And then as soon as it cracks down, then my idea is to move here and lock in that no lose plus dinner for two. And then I have two positions short, and I feel great. But if this thing does get through the Dragon and the RL30 and the PSAR, this is that tactical neutral zone in here where I'm being very cautious. It's not till it gets past the PSAR that I start feeling like it's I can have a long bias on this side. So this is that no man's land, that land between the rivers. This is confirmation of the failure. If it just mucks around in here, that's that argument for, hey, how could this thing become a sideways quiet channel? Well, if it just kind of mucks around in here, but never breaks down much below that, or breaks down below 320, so that that sideways quiet channel is if it just stays south of the PSAR. And then if this happens, what you have is declining volatility, and then you have this sort of descending triangle. And the longer this thing fails to fail, but fails to break out, you start getting a really tightly constrained price compression in here. And if that happens, then you have a Z3 pinch or a super pinch and then we play for that. Then the big breakout is better. So those are the kind of the scenarios. The grinding up, collapsing down, sideways compression into a Z3P with the different indicators that we have to uh, make sense of all that. Okay? So I'm beating that horse to death. Let me know if that was helpful. All right, so let's just plow right into the weekend strategy report now. I'm sure glad I'm recording this. You're right. Uh, let's see right here. So we have moved back into bullish normal. Uh, today's little bounce, you can almost see the you know price turning the corner. It came back up to a 78 on the three-day NDX. Um, risk Z, just quietly getting better. So those great big panic sell-offs just haven't quite materialized, although we've gotten down to a 
it's, you know, knock on wood, uh, it hasn't collapsed. Um, coming close to the next blended monthly rebalancing. This is what we have been holding this month. These are the symbols that are still leading the way. So the, the techs are still doing well. Um, the precious metals, uh, clean energy, uh, the S&P, those things are still in play. XLY is, is looking new. That's that consumer discretionary. And I think that's, again, fueled mostly by Amazon. Um, and even, you know, a little bit, oh yeah, materials, XLB was kind of the other, the other interesting newcomer to the game. Right? What's fallen off is that the emerging markets have not followed through as much. So, um, so if we were doing this tomorrow, then the, um, uh, you'd end up kind of shifting away from the globals and more towards maybe U.S. materials, something like that. Um, I would note that the uh, ETF2 theoretical exposure is incrementing money out of the market right now as, uh, in, as uncertainty goes up. Um, uh, ATR percentage is about 2.2. I said 2.4. It was my estimate. But, so 2.2 is where we're at. The ADX is back to something like a more of a normal, just normally strong instead of abnormally strong. We're still about 4% above the sideways channel. Um, on a monthly basis, uh, this monthly, that's really the first collapsing month that we've had ever since this one. Right? Um, here's where that, that 320, 310, 300 aligns pretty nicely with the dragon. You know, and uh, that 323 that I talked about is the potential um, for a uh, for a short. You would see that like right here is basically the skin of the dragon. So uh, the monthly dragon has a lot to, to teach us about, you know, boundaries and sectors and areas of operation to work in. So, you know, you can spend time working inside this inside these spaces you know so there's 340 and there's 330 so it almost feels like right now that the ten dollar the ten dollar steps that's like a three percent uh step function in here on that price ladder and um that's where we are right now between 330 and 320. So on the weekly, um, a long losing streak that closed below last week's close. So even though today was a little bounce, and even though the week was up, it closed higher than it opened, which is the beginning of, of help, I suppose. Um, you just notice that this little intermediate was over faster than this one and this this was only a five week sell off and the response was immediate so this this has been a five week um, a little sell-off, but I would consider this a, uh, you know, a critical state. It's right at fair value. It's blown off a lot of the excess. It's still holding to some important price levels here. That's that 323 once again. And then 320 is this key price level to the downside. Get, it breaks through the PSR, and then the price, you know, the, the price move is to there. Yeah. 
then to 290, 280, 270. So this is really a critical state right now. And I think it's going to get played out in terms of the response to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Trump being an absolute clown and not committing to a peaceful transfer of power. I mean, good Lord, playing Russian roulette with the national psychology. Just not a serious person. Enough already. Who's going to be the grown-up in the room? Um, it's got to get above, I'm going to call that about 348. Let's just call it 350 before it's really free and clear. But that's the next that's the next stage up. We've already seen the daily to death. Um, so quite a mixed bag now on this. This little pull off has been enough to drive some of the weaker sectors down below their four month moving average, which is why you're seeing uh, a number of cash positions now. So that's telling you where the weak hands are and uh, consumer discretionary. Pretty good. Um, technology. Pretty good. Uh, treasuries. People hedging just in case. Uh, I can feel that. People hedging with utilities. Defensive plays. This is a clear vote against the uh, emerging markets. Just let that sink in for a little while. That's rotating away from the globals and into defensive U.S. Um, these two defensive U.S. positions right there. Which makes me want, it reminds me to make sure I look at real estate here on the next chart. I want to find real estate. Where's that at? Yeah, that's a stealth, a stealth place. If you think about, um, you know, utilities as that defensive play that did well, um, real estate showed a little bit of signs of life. Uh, food showed some signs of life. Treasuries and bonds, people starting to hedge quietly. Yeah, even Japan um, storing some money, not in the emerging markets, not in the U.S., away from gold and silver and all that stuff, but just, you know, the most stable, boring economy ever. Uh, lots of weakness coming into the Dow now. But Nike. The, an anomaly. Microsoft recovering some of its mojo. Uh, I would say also Apple. I just, I think that's a, that's a winner there. And I think there's uh, where you're getting a chance to still buy quality on sale is the fact that it's still down 11% over the last month, but it bounced up to, so boy, that's, uh, that's looking more and more like yeah, we got a chance to buy Apple on sale. Could this be finally Intel getting its head out of its, out of the sand, I should say it that way. Kind of bucking the trend of all the weak things being weak. Intel is noticeable by the failure to fail further, and that's information. Sector spiders. Consumer discretionary, XLY. And that's how the um, that ETF2 and blended monthly rebalancing sniff out some of these um, stealthier candidates. Notice how that came up on the uh, blended monthly rebalancing schedule. 
utilities. It just keep highlighting that. It's the same idea, but putting it in context. That's what I'm noticing there. And then just, uh, how bad can it be? The easier one to believe on the weak side for shorter tactical trading energy. That's why Devon is kind of on my short list for directional trades either way, because it adds so much more volatility to it. Um, let's go to the world market model. Oil just getting smashed. Tech, the lone bright spot. Even if I may say it this way, silver losing its luster, still in the green, but off a big, big deal. Material starting to look good and discretionary and tech. Uh, this is all U.S. versus the world. And even emerging markets, which had been the best, is something that the models are saying rotate out of. Maybe that's just a, a function of that. Um, uh, once the election is over, then it's just back to business and new driver. Start driving. And that's going to resolve a lot of the. Um, the tension, I almost used a swear word there. Got to remember the kids. So maybe that's what the, this, maybe we're coming to a conclusion now. I think that's the energy just getting shredded. I think it's the big techs. I think that's where we're going to be. I mean, that's, that's a bold prediction, isn't it? Mm. Materials, green and white. Even India, green and white, I didn't expect that. So green and white, again, that's that was good, now great, exploit new strength, and you can turbo it. You know, yeah, can you turbo it? Yes, you can. Why? Because they're the new leaders. Whereas all these things that are green and green, um, that's not news that those things are doing well. This green and white is the new news. We'll just come down and look at the tail end of the, oops, tail end of the screen here. The thing's getting shredded. So red and yellow are the ones that are um, uh, really getting smashed. So they were already weak, but they're even weaker. And that's the uh, that's the income, guys. Hmm. Okay, clear. Um, these right here, uh, yellow, or I'm sorry, white and yellow. That was below average, is now above average. So these are the things that are starting to quietly emerge from the pack. And so those are um, those are U.S. funds. So a quiet reemphasis of the U.S. funds. There's materials again. Yeah, in India. So uh, white and yellow is sort of like green and white, but one step earlier in the cycle. Now to the daily. Just a couple um, overreactions. Strength leaders. 
strength laggards. Just a handful of dojis today in the Dow 30. Let me let that come up on your screen. Bunch of 551Ws, as you would expect. Plenty of auto framers because of the distance to the 10-day high, plus the fact that it was a lower volatility day than previously. Maybe Nike's starting to lose its shine a little bit here. I think Apple is, is still a, a quiet opportunity. It's hard to, hard to say that with a straight face, but dang, that's an opportunity still. In the ETFs, only a few uh, dojis, tons of auto framers. Uh, a good number of channeling and overreactions. Real estate made a little quiet move today. So I'm going to nominate that as my little stealth candidate there. But otherwise, it was tech. Lots in the auto framer and the squeeze to choose from, so I'm not going to read through all that. I'll leave that for you to do your math, but lots of squeezes and uh, auto framers. No surprises in the MACD four seasons, the domination of the winter season and late fall. Um, but this is also a place where we could start looking at the uh, at the ETF spring. So I'll let that come up on your screen. Now you can see it. It's the um, it's tech, the mid caps, small caps in the U.S. Um, starting to make the moves. Early in the spring, still Apple. Maybe McDonald's. Time to look at that one too. Honeywell and Johnson and Johnson clear summers, and and Treasuries clear in the summer. So I, I'm liking my position there. All right, guys, that's everything I wanted to cover for today. Spend a little more time on the uh, interpretive dance, if we will. Um, tomorrow's lesson uh, for the uh, the daily podcast, I'm just going to go ahead and do that at 8. Um, I've got a full day of soccer tomorrow, so we're not going to do a morning session. Uh, I will get that adjusted, but it's going to start at 8 p.m., and I think in the future I'm just going to keep everything at 8 o'clock, so it's always uh, always easy. Let's see how that goes. Um, Tomorrow's lesson, uh, Ken Hum asked me to take a look at how to, you know, the mechanics of computing R multiples when you're studying different systems and strategies. Um, and I have, th there are two ways that I go about doing that. So I'm going to talk about that both for intraday and for swing trading. That'll be the, you know, the, the, the trader's toolbox for um, analyzing your R, multi R multiples. Okay. So that's everything I got for tonight. Need to get the doggies out on the road here and get their little fat butts running. Um, that's everything I got for you tonight, guys. Thanks for hanging in there, and we will see you in um, in the in the workshop tomorrow.